Hello there, I'm Ras Adibarazi. Thanks for tuning in to 7 edition, The Headlines. Government may destroy illegal foreign fishing boats encroaching Malaysian waters. Prime Minister warns against those out to topple government over its anti-corruption stance. And 200 Islamic clerics among over 600 foreigners expelled from Sri Lanka. Hello, it's good to see you again. We begin tonight's bulletin with this story. Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad has revealed that there are some civil servants who are rooting for the fall of the Pakatan Harapan government over its war on corruption. The Prime Minister said these people were claiming that the PH government was not as good as the previous administration because it rejected graft and bribery. Speaking at a town hall meeting with Perak civil servants in Ipoh, Tunok Tamadi stressed that leaders chosen by the people must be clean of corruption so that they could be examples to others. He added that the previous government's leaders were involved in corrupt practices and because of this, a number of civil servants also followed their examples. <laughs> pemimpin dan kerajaan sendiri, kerajaan pilihan rakyat sendiri mengamalkan rasuah, kita akan jadi mangsa. According to the Premier, for Malaysia to join the ranks of developed countries and to be an Asian tiger once again, all forms of corruption must be stamped out. Without corruption, every agenda set by the government can be implemented and run smoothly. The country also could easily achieve its goals to become a high-income economy. Moving on, police will call up organisers of the Rally to Defend the Sovereignty of Islam and the Constitution at Jalan Tuanku Abdurrahman Kuala Lumpur yesterday, which was said to have been held without the approval of the authorities. Dangwangi OCPD, ACP Muhammad Fami Visu Nathan Abdullah said the organisers would be called up in the near future to assist investigations. On Saturday, he was reported to have said that the notice from the organisers of the rally was incomplete as the organisers, Gerakan Pembela Uma, failed to submit the notice of approval from Kuala Lumpur City Hall. The rally, which was reported to have been held following several latest issues, including the ratification of the Rome Statute, began from Masjid Jamik Kuala Lumpur and ended at 3.25pm due to heavy rain. Police have arrested a man who allegedly slapped a woman driver at Jalan Datuk Kramat, Kuala Lumpur last Thursday. Wang Samaju Police Chief Superintendent Nur Azmi Yusuf said the suspect was detained at about 10pm on the same day at a house in Kampung Datuk Kramat. He also said the suspect has been remanded for four days from May 3rd to assist investigations into the case under the penal code. Last Thursday, a video which went viral on social media showed a woman being slapped on the face by the suspect. The victim was said to have entered a junction without using her car's signal indicator and almost hit the suspect's motorcycle, which allegedly enraged the man. Two Bangladeshi workers died when they were crushed to death by crates of kurma or dates at a warehouse in Bukit Merta, Jampinang today. Their co-worker, also a Bangladeshi, said he heard the loud crash in the warehouse around 10.30 a.m. and saw two of his colleagues pinned under the crates. Just before the incident, both men were believed to be moving boxes on the lower half of the pallet. However, it is understood that this shifted the load on top, which led to the crates falling on them. The other workers then quickly pulled the door out from under the pallet 
trial, but the two victims identified as Ali Mohamed Bakar, age 32, and Rabani Boran Udin, 26, died on the spot. Central Sabrang Prior Police Chief Assistant Commissioner Nick Ros Azhan Nick Abdul Hamid said the bodies were sent to the Bukit Murtajam Hospital for post-mortem, and the case was classified as sudden death. Sabah Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia or Bersatu has received approval from the Registry of Societies to open 26 party divisions in the state and Labuan. Bersatu President Tan Sri Mohidin Yassin said the party received the green light from the ROS on May 3rd. Ada sudah ada lebih 127,000 yang lalu mereka-mereka yang sudah mendaftar untuk menjadi ahli. Jadi selepas daripada ini, bila bahagian-bahagian sudah terhubung, mereka yang menjadi ahli itu akan masuk ke bahagian-bahagian yang berkenaan. He was speaking to reporters after handing over the ROS approval letters to Sabah Bersatu Koordinator Datuk Sri Hajiji Noor. Tan Sri Mohidin also hopes the formation of 26 divisions could be materialised within the next three months. Bersatu Sabah was officially launched by Prime Minister Tun Dr Mahathir Mohamad in Penampang on April 6. Still in Sabah, Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Sri Dr Wan Aziza Wan Ismail is confident DAP candidate Vivian Wong Sheyi will receive the support of Sandakan voters in the upcoming parliamentary by-election on May 11th. She said this when met by reporters after doing the rounds at the weekend market together with Wong in the constituency today. We came to the pasar pagi and we found that the sambutan is good. Dan kita nakkanlah, walaupun ada 60% adalah muri uh, sempatan, 40% memanglah pengunjung-pengunjung uh, yang datang ke pasar ini. Namun kita rasa bahawa insyaAllah kita dapat uh, dapat sokongan untuk calon kita, calon nombor tiga, uh, Vivian kita yang akan menggantikan uh, mendiam bapaknya. The Sandakan by-election is being held following the death of the parliamentary seats incumbent, the late Tian Fat, on March 28 due to a heart attack. The Election Commission has set May 7th for early voting and polling day on May 11th. It will be a five-cornered fight with Vivian taking on Parti Bersatu Sabah, PBS Vice President Datuk Linda Sen Tao Lin and three other independent candidates. Elsewhere, Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng said he is confident that Malaysia is on the right track to strengthening the economy and fiscal status by 2021 and becoming an Asian tiger again. The government intends to reduce the current debt and liabilities of 1 trillion ringgit or 80% of the GDP in the course of this period to 65% through the renegotiation of mega projects. In an interview with Bernama, Lim said after seven months of taking over the government, Pakatan Harapan has managed to reduce the government's debts and liabilities to 1.07 trillion ringgit or a reduction of 17 million ringgit. The government also estimated about 805 million in savings had been made through renegotiation of infrastructure projects such as the mass rapid transit. He added that the abolishment of GST did not bankrupt the government as feared by some quarters and the 4 billion ringgit in tax raised will be allocated for critical ministries and the people. In other developments, Lim said the Pakatan Harapan government had begun the process of repaying tax refund arrears of 37 billion left by the previous government. The process started in January this year and will be completed by October. International rating agencies had also maintained their A3 ratings for Malaysia and foreign direct investments, or FDIs, also increased by 48% last year. According to Lim, the country recorded a 48% increase in approved FDIs across all sectors at 80 billion ringgit last year. Now, PH leaders were reminded that they must uh, not cave in to pressure but instead honour their promises to the people. PKR President Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim admitted that the coalition had problems communicating its policies and decisions to the people. However, they should remain confident and continue working hard. Kita mungkin menghadapi masalah semasa, tetapi saya yakin akhirnya 
Kalau kita laksanakan pemerintahan yang bebas, yang telus, yang bersih, tidak mempamerkan kesombongan kelangkuhan kuasa, mempamerkan budaya seperti mana budaya yang lapuk yang lama dengan kemewahan dan dengan kesombongan dan keangkuhan, saya yakin beri tempoh dalam beberapa tahun lagi rakyat akan tetap mempertahankan Pakatan Harapan. Speaking at the 2019 DAP National Conference, Datuk Sri Anwar said the coalition's biggest weakness since winning the general election has been convincing the public about the benefits of its policies. He admitted that there are certain sections of the public who may feel sidelined due to the policies implemented, but the government can't ignore the plight of the extremely poor B40 group who still need defending. Datuk Sri Anwar also urged DAP to remain true to its reform pledges and to use the previous sacrifices of the party's leaders as motivation to stay the course during the transition period. At the same event, Lim Guan Eng, who is DAP Secretary General, said the formation of Independent Police Complaints and Misconduct Commission, or IPCMC, is to ensure that there will be no abuse of power within the police force. He also said IPCMC was not aimed to penalise the police, but to take action against any form of misconduct. Bukan untuk kenakan sesiapa. Bukan. Bukan untuk kenakan polis. Tidak. Jauh daripada itu, tetapi untuk memastikan bahawa kuasa besar yang diberikan kepada satu institusi penting seperti polis di Raja Malaysia bolehlah memastikan kalau ada berlaku penyelakunan kuasa oleh segelintir daripada pasukan polis ini tindakan boleh diambil. Itu sahaja. Lim pointed out that the new Inspector General of Police, Datuk Sri Abdul Hamid Bado, also agreed to the formation of the Commission. The IPCMC is a police oversight body proposed by a Royal Commission of Inquiry in 2005 to improve the police force following a spate of death in custody cases. However, the proposal was rejected by both the serving and retired policemen. The government has not ruled out destroying any foreign fishing vessels found in Malaysian waters. Agriculture and Agro-based Industry Minister Datuk Salahuddin Ayub said this would be the government's last course of action if it found many foreign fishing vessels encroaching into Malaysian waters. The government has set up a multi-ministry task force made up of the Defence Ministry, Home Ministry and Agriculture and Agro-based Industry Ministry to combat illegal fishing vessels. Datuk Salahuddin added this as there were still cases of foreign fishing vessels found in Malaysian waters, despite joint enforcement efforts in reducing their presence. Kalau ini pun, dengan keterlibatan Menteri uh, uh, Pertahanan pun, uh, mereka pun nak langgar juga, uh, saya akan fikirkan sesuatu dan termasuklah mungkin kita mengambil langkah yang sama, kita hapuskan basal-basal mereka. Bakal. Sekiranya uh, uh, apa, operasi yang ada ini tidak berkesan, itu kita bincang kemudian di pengangkai binat. Illegal fishing by sea poachers has not only costed the country 6 billion ringgit in fish products annually, but also inflicted damages to marine resources and the ecosystem. On the foreign front, Indonesian authorities have sunk 51 foreign ships as part of the government's efforts to clamp down on illegal fishing a week after a naval vessel clashed with a Vietnamese coast guard near the South China Sea. The seized ships were sunk on Saturday at five ports across the archipelago, which has some of the world's richest fishing grounds. Among the seized vessels sunk were 38 Vietnamese flagged ships, six Malaysian, two Chinese and one Filipino vessel. While the rest were foreign-owned ships using the Indonesian flag. Authorities say the country suffered great economic loss from lax regulations that gave leeway for foreign boats to fish in Indonesian waters. Since President Joko Widodo took office in 2014, hundreds of captured foreign fishing vessels have been sunk more than half from Vietnam. Sunday's move came after an Indonesian Navy patrol ship was rammed by two Vietnamese Coast Guard ships 
after intercepting a boat it says was fishing illegally in its waters. Coming up, man spouting hate gets a surprise egging. Details next. I'm Ras Adibarazi and you're still with us on 7 edition. The Health Ministry has targeted Malaysia to be declared a human indigenous malaria free nation by the World Health Organization WHO by 2020. Health Ministry Director General Datuk Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah said to achieve this, Malaysia must show commitment in its efforts to maintain zero human indigenous malaria status for three consecutive years. He said this in a statement in conjunction with World Malaria Day 2019 themed Zero Malaria Starts with me. According to Datuk Dr. Nur Hisham, the ministry is now actively getting its health teams ready at all levels for the WHO's certification of malaria elimination audit process, in which Malaysia's malaria elimination program has seen success in the reduction of cases. This also showed that Malaysia was on the right track towards achieving the zero malaria target. He added in a statement that the National Malaria Elimination Strategic Plan was also introduced in the same year with the target of malaria free status by 2020. To meet this target, the cooperation of stakeholders in the plantation, agricultural, security and forest recreation sectors is key to protect its workers from being infected. This includes ensuring all foreign workers undergo government-sanctioned health screening, including for malaria and for infected workers to have proper access to health care services. The Health DG also hoped all parties will mobilise their efforts to achieve the zero human indigenous malaria status target. World Malaria Day is internationally observed and commemorated every year on April 25th to recognise global efforts in controlling the disease. Now let's head on to over daily uh, segment, uh, Clickbait, where we take a look at what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. A protester believed to be a supporter of US President Donald Trump was egged by another man as he was spewing hate speech at a street corner in New York City. In the incident, which had gone viral on social media, the individual wearing a swastika and carrying what was believed to be a Nazi flag had to learn the hard way that hate is not a yoke. Here's the story. The 26-year-old man, said to be a white supremacist, had been using homophobic and anti-Semitic language to express his anti-LGBTQ views at New York City's Union Square recently. Various news outlets had identified the man as Giovanni Valle, a well-known right-wing activist, as he was defending his actions when several people confronted him and debated with him, another bystander, who apparently had just done some grocery shopping nearby, overheard Valle's offensive remarks and pelted an egg on the man's head. Valle then chased after his egger and tackled him to the ground. But several New Yorkers quickly came to the egg man's aid and threw the Nazi supporter to the ground before throwing away his flag. The over eight minute long video uploaded by Elise Fredericks on Facebook has garnered over 133,000 views and about 2,000 shares. Caesarean delivery is definitely no joke. Mothers who have gone for C-section operation takes a long time to recover, but sometimes using unproved remedies for the wound can turn disastrous. This happened recently when a lady's C-section wound turned yellow and brown after she applied turmeric to the affected part. Take a look. In a Facebook post by Dr. Muhammad Izad, he said that one of his patients was having severe pains on her fresh C-section wounds and he had asked her if she had applied anything on them. His patient explained to him that she had put turmeric and manjakani, a species of oak, after someone recommended them to her. However, the wound became severely infected and there was a lot of pus coming out of it, which also caused her to feel unbearable pain. According to Dr. Izad, it is common for women to get their C-section wounds infected. If the wound is severely infected, the mother would have to be warded and given intravenous antibiotics and regular wound cleanings. Netizens have been reminded not to simply apply any remedies on the C-section wound without prescription. It is advisable to clean the bruise with water and allow to dry thoroughly to avoid inflammation. 
the internet has become a virtual friend slash counsellor as well uh, as an important source of information and help for young parents. It's available at their fingertips compared to the old days when new parents would have to rely on hand-me-down guidance and advice from their own moms and dads to raise their children. Despite the fast advancement of technology and how people today rely heavily on them to, uh, to live their lives, millennial parents must also ensure a balance so that they are not affected by the negative side of the digital age. Shafi Karazali looks deeper into the role of the internet in modern parenting. Between changing diapers, cooking meals and shuttling the kids all over town, parenthood can be nearly as exhausting, but tools like mobile commerce and social media have emerged to make life easier. Uh, when uh, this one is born, uh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to buy, I don't know what product to use, I don't know how to change diapers, but I learn, I learn a lot uh, to my wife and videos and internet. We as new millennial moms have so much more information. Um, for example, if your baby doesn't sleep at night, we just Google. You know, what's the best thing to get your baby to sleep at night? Or if your baby's, you know, not latching on well, what's the best thing? How do you help your baby latch on better? So we, and, and millennial moms, we have this, you know, at our fingertips, and our moms didn't have that. The Internet of Things has also helped millennials go through the stages of having their firstborn and adapt quickly to the changes. Dah dapat, dapat orang kata apa, dah dapat rentak dia kan. Ha, you, you dapat tahulah yang eh, sebenarnya tak mudah, you, you akan ada alahan, jadi you, you dah ready dah. Ha, jadi sebenarnya lebih mudah lah daripada yang first dulu. Parents nowadays, they want to know more, especially like 87% uh, of the parents, they want to know about baby emergency needs and 55% they want to know about healthy eating of the whole family and including the babies. Based on a Forbes article last year, 71% of millennials today value the advice and insights they receive from parenting blogs, parenting websites, forums and social networks. Parenting blogs, which started in the early 2000s, are now everywhere, covering topics ranging from co-sleeping to family travel. It's also a place where parents curate social experiences and interactions for their children. Also, most parents now are not shy or conflicted about sharing their children's lives online. 81% of modern Malaysian parents, especially celebrities, have shared images of their children on social media, compared to 47% of baby boomer parents. But it is important to know that although millennials depend a lot on technology, these gadgets or tools should not be used as a babysitter. This as children born from 2010 to 2025 are part of what's called Generation Alpha, which is considered by many to be the most tech-infused demographic to date. Researchers also said that kids use gadgets for various purposes like playing games, watching videos and listening to songs. But this is where parents often overlook, as the overexposures to gadgets can ultimately affect their children's vision, physical health and even mental growth. If you have a son or you have a daughter, just bear with them and don't give them so much time on gadgets. I give my, my, my son to watch YouTube and stuff. But I always bring him to any playgrounds outside so he can explore more uh, on, uh, with his body. Another downside of the internet is that it creates peer pressure among young parents and the urge to always be a step ahead of others due to being exposed to the attractive lifestyle of influences on social media. This obsession can be unhealthy as some young parents are also struggling to match the pricey lifestyle at the same time to cope with the rising cost of living. The key to creating and maintaining a healthy environment for generation alpha children is to practice moderation. Although it's good to take some information from the Internet of Things, it's always good to control the amount of information you share and take what is only applicable to your daily lives. Shafika Farahin for 7 Edition. When we return, seven Venezuelans killed in heli crash. Don't touch that dial. Hello again. Sri Lanka has expelled over 600 foreign nationals, including around 200 Islamic clerics, since the Easter suicide bombings. Authorities said on Sunday the clerics had entered the country illegally, but amid a security crackdown after the attacks, it was discovered that they have overstayed their visas, for which fines were imposed, forcing them to be expelled from the island. 
The Easter Sunday bombings were led by a local cleric who is known to have travelled to neighbouring India and had made contact with militants there. The ministry did not reveal the nationalities of those who have been expelled, but please mention many foreigners who have overstayed their visas since the Easter attacks were from Bangladesh, India, Maldives and Pakistan. Sri Lanka's visa policy underwent an overhaul, following fears that foreign clerics could radicalize locals for a repeat of the April 21st suicide blast, which targeted three Christian churches and three luxury hotels, which killed 257 people and wounded nearly 500. Sri Lanka has imposed a state of emergency since the attacks and given wide powers to troops and police to arrest and detain suspects for long periods. House-to-house -house searches are being carried out across the country, looking for explosives and propaganda material of extremists. Seven Venezuelan military officers were killed Saturday when their helicopter crashed outside Caracas. Its defence ministry in a statement said the chopper had left the Venezuelan capital in the morning, headed for San Carlos, when it went down in the mountainous area of the El Haltilo municipality. On Twitter, Maduros mourned the loss of seven worthy officers of the country. They included two majors, three captains and two lieutenant colonels. The defence ministry has launched an investigation into the crash. Maduro was in San Carlos on Saturday, leading military exercises with top brass and more than 5,000 troops. It was a show of strength against opposition leader Juan Guaido, whose attempt to launch a military uprising earlier in the week had failed. Guaido was continuing his efforts to persuade the armed forces to abandon Maduro.